Today is the continuation of the lecture, the Bible study that was done three weeks ago on transcendental meditation and yoga. And what I'm going to do is someone asked me, because they missed that one, they, they were asking me if I can repeat what I did last time. I can't repeat all of it because we don't have time, but I'll repeat some of it and then I'll finish off where I left off from last time. Okay, so the lecture is on Hinduism part two, Transcendental Meditation, which is TM, and yoga. Uh, let me pray. God, you know, we do everything with the purpose, and at the, the end result is to give you glory, and that's my hope. That's my heart. I pray that that will be our heart, everyone's heart here also. We thank you that you give us the facilities uh, this, you know, beautiful place where we can just get together, enjoy a donut, enjoy fellowship, and listen to your word. So please help me to communicate your word. If there are questions here today that arises from this talk, we just pray that you'll help us address it and that you'll point us to the right resources for answers, God. But the, the goal here, God, is to give you glory and to learn particular skills or little nuggets of knowledge which would equip us and enable us to be more effective evangelists and missionaries, God. That's my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So TM and yoga, let's do a quick review here. Dr. Walter Martin, who wrote the book, The Kingdom of the Cults, says there is no single Hindu idea of God. In other words, when we talk about Hinduism philosophy, it's a smorgasbord, it's a buffet of, of, of a religion, if you, if you would call it that, it's more a philosophy where it incorporates many different ideas all lumped into one. That's how India, the country is, and as it's spread out to the West, that's how some of the Western countries or countries in the West, in Europe, United States, uh, that's how they adopted it. They, they really like, a lot of people that are secular people really like a buffet religion customized for their own desires. So, uh, and that would be called New Age. So there's Hinduism and then there's New Age, which we're going to study in a couple of weeks. Let's, let's look at some terms that we went through. These are really important terms because Hinduism, Buddhism, all the Eastern philosophies flow out of these terms. So we talked about monism, which is all existence is one. You guys, you guys all have your notes from last time? I have, I'm not sure if you brought your notes, but if you, did, if you didn't have some copies here, does anyone need a copy? I just, okay, um, can someone help me pass them out? Let me see. I only made about 20 copies because last time I gave out 50. I'm guessing that you guys still have it. If, Matt, do you think you can do me a favor and make some copies of that? Or someone, someone that knows how to use a machine? Or, okay. Does anyone else need a copy? Okay. If I can have someone, if I can make about 10 copies or so. Thank you so much. Okay, so. <clears throat> Monism, all existence is one. Nothing exists independently. Nothing exists separately is what monism is. You go from monism, and the next idea would be pantheism, which is all existence then is God. That would make sense, right? If all existence is one, if there's no separation, no independent thing, then in pantheism, it just builds on that. All existence is God. That's where it becomes a little bit dangerous, because if everything is God, we're talking about, you know, a rock, this podium, this table. You and I, people, we are also God. All these things are are one, right? There's no separation. Everything is God. 
And so you'll see as we talk a little bit more about Hinduism, you'll see why you can become God in the Hindu religion. Pantheism, there's Hinduism, pantheism, there's also Hinduism, polytheism. Again, it's a mix, a smorgasbord of different ideas depending on the taste or the sect of the people that are worshiping. Polytheism is the worship of many gods. Poly is a word, many. Theism, God, worship of many gods. From, that, from there, there was a German philosopher. Um, he coined this term called henotheism, which is the worship of one god among many gods that possibly could exist. Hino, the word hino in a Greek is of one, the worship of one God. So when you're, for example, when you are worshiping many gods, um, it's possible that there is one supreme God. As the religion continued, as the philosophy continued to develop, right, they're worshiping many different gods. It's, it's a really weird philosophy because it's like, Supposedly, everything is all one. There's no separation. But then in polytheism, it's kind of like there's all these avatars. There's 330 avatars which comes from the Supreme One. We talked about everything is one, which is called Brahman, the ultimate universe. And then it breaks down into these avatars, right, which is these incarnations. There's 330 million of them, and that's polytheism. There's 330 million... 330 million different gods. And out of the 330 million, one of them, depending on what sect you are in Hinduism, you can worship one of them as your supreme. Kind of like the Hare Krishnas, Krishnas, they worship Krishna as their supreme god. The Hare Krishnas, we talked about them, are more the peaceful type of the Hinduist. Okay. Monotheism, then, is the worship of one god, which is, there's just one God. There's not many gods, which is the three major religions of Judaism, you know, Christianity, and Islam. Any questions from these terms? There's more, but I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible. We probably want to keep the first three in our mind, monism, pantheism, and polytheism, because Hinduism is very prominent in these three. Okay, C.S. Lewis, at the end of all religious quests, one must choose between Hinduism and Christianity. The former absorbs all others and the latter excludes them. I'm just basically repeating things we talked about for those of you who haven't been able to join us yet. Okay, so when we talk about yoga and transcendental meditation, we're talking about this guy named Pantan Jali. Pantanjali, he is the guy, let me see, read from my notes. He's the main guy when it comes to yoga. He wrote this classic text, classic Hindu text called the Yoga Sutras. Okay, let me get this here. Okay, here it is. Yoga and TM can be traced back uh, to Pantanjali, uh, who is a sage. Tradition has it that Vishnu and a very wise sage sent him to earth to cure mental illnesses. Pantanjali came to earth to give his knowledge of yoga. He only had two conditions uh, for him to teach yoga. He needed 1,000 people present. Imagine you say, I'm only going to teach you Sunday school class if 1,000 people came. So that's what he said. I, 1,000 people, and then there needs to be a screen between him and the people where he can transfer information, knowledge, uh, over to them, where there's a screen that's blocking him and 1,000 people. He can transfer his knowledge and kind of wow them and make them feel better. Allegedly, that's what he did. And then uh, they told him, you got to write this knowledge down. He wrote it down in his, in his classic work called the Yoga Sutras, Okay. And from all forms of yoga comes all the forms that, of yoga that we have today and TM, Transcendental Meditation, comes from the classic work, Yoga Sutras. 
let's talk about yoga a little bit. Yoga comes out of the Vedas, which is Hindu holy scriptures. You compare, compare the Vedas to the Holy Bible. Shiva, which is one of the three main gods of Hinduism, is called Yoga Shwara, or Lord of Yoga. Therefore, yoga is an ancient, Hindu practice being used in the West to relieve stress and improve the mental and physical health of people living in a fast, competitive culture. Yoga calls itself a science. See, in order for it to be accepted, they have to kind of westernize it a little bit because when you're talking about people that grew up in the West, in the United States and Europe, we're kind of afraid. I mean, we might be a little bit different because we all have relatives that live in the East, so we're kind of used to it. However, if you're a person that American or European, right, or Australian, you grew up in the West and science is predominant. So if you can, you, you can put things under the, in this case, the disguise of science, then people will accept it more. It's not one of those weird pagan religions that's out there, right? Those weird pagan religions is Hinduism or Eastern mysticism, but it's scientific. There's scientific proof. So when they started marketing that under the disguise of science, people like the YMCA, right, which is the, is the, is the Young Men's Christian Club, uh, supposedly started that way, began adopting it, adapting yoga. In fact, you can look in a lot of YMCA websites today and they'll have yoga classes. The question is, is yoga uh, a science? Well, dressed in Western clothes, yoga has gained acceptance in medicine, psychology, education, and religion under such euphemisms as centering, relaxation therapy, self-hypnosis, and creative visualization. Is yoga really a science? According to uh, this professor, Indian professor, yoga is Hinduism. It's not science. A lot of Hindus, people with that knowledge, they'll say it's not science. And you want to get a source. You don't, you don't want to get the source from a Christian professor who's teaching Hinduism in seminary. You want to get the source from a Hindu who practices yoga, right? And this guy here says yoga is Hinduism. There is an estimated 15 to 20 million people practicing yoga in the U.S., an estimated of 50,000 to 100,000 yoga instructors offering classes at 20,000 plus location, locations. It is a multi-billion billion dollar craze in North America, according to this former yoga practice, practitioner, Laureate Willis. There's probably more. This, I got this quote about 10 years ago. There's definitely is more, more today. I found this quote by this Christian Indian professor. Uh, he says, the postmodern deconstructionist movement has thus provided fertile ground for the spread of Eastern movement. Remember when I talked about, we talked about postmodernism about two months ago? We also talked about postmodernism with the advent of computers and the internet, we have a fast knowledge of the world. Before, we just concentrated, you know, our kids concentrated on Bible study. We studied the Bible. That's all we knew. All of a sudden, when the computers came, we have knowledge of all different types of cultures and religions around the world and information we didn't have, that we only have access to when you go to the library and you do extensive research. But now we can get it within minutes in your own personalized computer so it kind of throws off people a little bit easier when you have so much information and you're thinking, you're saying to yourself, well, I'm not sure if my Christianity is correct because there is this religion, this religion, this religion, and they all seem good. They're coming from different countries. Why should Christianity be superior? So what happened is that people started Christians now. I'm talking about Christians. Many Christian friends of mine have what they've done, they began to deconstruct Christianity. Remember we talked about uh, the modernists, they constructed buildings that were very linear, they're scientifically based, it's like one, to, one step, one to 10, you just build a building and it's squared, 
it's beautiful, but it's squared. And then you got the postmodern building, which is a reaction, which is not linear, but it's artistic and has all different types of angles. You can't, you can't, you know, confine it to a science. That's postmodernism. So what happens is that we kind of using those two as metaphors for what's happening philosophically in our mind, we've deconstructed the modern building, we've deconstructed Christianity where we learn in Bible study steps one through 100, Genesis to Revelation, and we reconstructed uh, a philosophy called postmodernism where we've adapted many different beliefs into our Christianity. Uh, in, in many cases, if, if our foundation is not very good, we begin adopting different ideas and say, well, I'm a Christian, but I also believe that the Hindu and the Muslim can go to heaven. Um, or I believe I can practice yoga, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I can lump them all together. That's postmodernism, okay? And so, so this internet, this postmodern philosophy um, gave fertile grounds for Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Eastern mystical religions to be adopted into the West. Okay. Two popular forms of yoga came into the West. We talked about this. Number one is Hatha Yoga. Hatha is a general category that includes most, most yoga styles. When we talk about yoga, just know that most of them come from Hatha Yoga. There's eight steps to every form of yoga that's from Hatha Yoga. There is a common misconception in the West that Hatha Yoga is a neutral form of exercise, an effective alternative for those who abhor jogging and calisthenics. It could be true. However, Hatha Yoga is one of the six recognized systems of Orthodox Hinduism. It is also one of the most difficult and potentially dangerous forms of yoga. Hatha is derived from the word hath, which means to oppress. Other popular forms of Hatha yoga include Iyengar, which is a, a main yoga practice in San Francisco, and Kundalini, which we'll talk about today. There are many forms of yoga today, many, 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 but these are some of the most popular forms, and they all come from Hatha yoga, and they all come from the Yoga Sutras um, from, the, from the past. Okay, second most popular form is what we call transcendental meditation, short TM. Okay. It is a spiritual practice of yoga. In nine, let's do a little quick history of it. In 1959, it was first introduced into the West by Marahishi Mahesh Yogi as a religious exercise and philosophy in Hawaii, San Francisco, and El Hay. I mean, these are three places where many people from our church come from or grew up in under the spiritual regeneration movement. The spiritual regeneration movement, which happened, I believe it was 19, well, 1959, which happened in L.A., is the first building uh, with the goal of promoting TM worldwide, yoga worldwide. That's Marahishi Mahesh Yoga. It was first received with skepticism from Westerners, of course. I mean, it's some pagan, right? It's some pagan thing from the East. I mean, you got a guy that looks like that. You're probably a little scared of him, right? He's not clean cut or anything, but, you know, he's this guy, uh, this little man. We've got to be very careful. So it was a lot of skepticism at first. Uh, 1967, by then, the Beatles got other celebrities and youth involved. So when you got a popular band like the Beatles, right? Um, George Harrison, the guy to his left, he got all his Beatles buddies, they all flew down to India and they you know, had a course, they hung out with this guy and then they liked it, they adopted yoga into their practice, transcendental meditation, and then they started promote it, promoting it in their tours, in their concerts. So when you got the Beatles behind you, uh, it's gonna go fast. The influence is going to go fast. In the 1970s, the world plan movement, uh, the emphasis then shifted again from religion to science. Again, they have to market it under the disguise, disguise of science in order to promote it in the West well. 1977, the U.S. courts 
prohibited TM from being taught in uh, New Jersey public schools. 1980s, TM movement came under accusations of pseudoscientific deception. They lost a lot of funding from the government because of that. 1980s, it moved its headquarters, right, to the Netherlands, where uh, the headquarters is still today. The TM program is the most widely practiced and extensively researched program of self-development in the world. When you promote something as self-development, people like that. Okay, let's look at the process. So what Maharishi Mahesh Yoga did with the Beatles and with students that flew over to India was that he took them behind his room and he was going to teach them what TM is. He, is, he would assign a non-syllable -syllab word to each practitioner Kind of like, mmm, mmm, there's no syllables, right? You repeat this word audibly, which is a mantra, during all your waking moments. So, mmm, right? It's kind of like a mantra. There's no syllables to it. And you, re re you repeat this word constantly throughout your waking moments. After a period of time, a few days, when a conscious mind was preoccupied with that word, the uh, he or she forces the emptying of that word. You have to force yourself to empty that word from your mind after a few days. At that moment of blankness, if you're able to do that, you reach enlightenment. Step number five. So once you have reached enlightenment, you have transcended you're now like above and beyond. That's where the word transcendental meditation came from. You have transcended from your ignorance and united it with Brahman. Okay, remember we talked about pantheism, right? Pantheism then, all is God, God is all. There's no difference between a carrot and a rock, this chair and this podium. There's no difference between you and the chair. You're all God. You're just ignorant of that. You're really connected to the ultimate reality, Brahman, who is the Hindu God, ultimate supreme God. You just don't realize that because you're flooded with anxiety and worries. You're preoccupied with the mundane. However, if you do TM, if you practice TM and you empty yourself of all those anxieties, all that stuff, you will transcend from your ignorance and you will connect yourself with the, the ultimate reality which is Brahman, you will realize that you are God. See, first six, the, step six, the mind is said to have clutter that blocks one's potential. Once one has successively emptied his mind, he has reached his unlimited human potential. So we got a guy like Deepak Chopra, who's a new age guy, right? He writes, he writes this book called The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, and he markets it as a um, you know, business book for people who are very busy, but you want to be successful. You want to be balanced. You want to be centered. You want to be awakened, you know. And, and so if you're a balanced, awakened, and, you know, and centered, you can be successful not only in your personal lives, but in your business. Seven spiritual laws. And the last law is, to, is if you practice these, you will reach your unlimited human potential. You know what reaching your unlimited human potential in New Age or Hinduism is? It means that you are a god. That's what it is. But of course, it's marked under and disguised, and there are words like, you know, scientific words, right? So you don't know that. What is yoga then? So we talked about transcendental, we talked about the history of TM, transcendental meditation. What is yoga? Yoga is a Sanskrit word which means union or join. Uh, it's the same English word we see in our English Bibles, yoke, right? It says, do not be un equally yoked with unbelievers. Do not be unequally joined or united with unbelievers. If you're a Christian, you have a new nature, right? 
non-Christian that has the old nature, you shouldn't marry a non-Christian because one has a, the nature of God and one has the nature of the flesh. Don't be unequally yoked or joined or united with the unbeliever, the Bible says. Same word. What is one united or joining with? That's the question, right? What are you joining yourself? In yoga, in Hinduism, what are you joining yourself with? Two things. Brahman, who's the ultimate reality, or Atman, which is your divine self. So you're either joining yourself with the Hindu God, the end of yoga. If you reach the eighth step, you're joining yourself with the Hindu God, or you're kind of joining yourself, you're kind of, you know, you're, you leave ignorance, you're transcendent, right? You're enlightened, you realize you're a God. Bo- both, both end results are, are not good. Not as a Christian anyways. It opposes the Christian worldview. Okay. We are extensions of Brahman, but we are ignorant of this. Same thing. We think we are independent from Brahman, but we're not. Remember we talked about monism? There's no independence. There's no independent parts. There's no separate separate or independent parts. So this comes from monism. Everything, everybody that thinks they're indi- indi- an individual, that's an illusion called maya. There's no such things, no such things as independence. I mean, think about this. If Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism is part of our ancestors, our relatives' practices, maybe not you guys' practices, but maybe our relatives, and some of us were born in the East, I was born in the East, my parents were, you know, and I think part of our Asian culture, we're very, we're community oriented. That's part of who God created us to be. But I would, I would venture to say that that's part of the philosophy too, that comes from the Eastern mysticism. Like we should be together. There's nothing separate, right? So we don't have good boundaries. Sometimes Asians don't have good boundaries. You know, I can just, I can just, ask you to do anything I want any time, you should just do it, right? We don't have good boundaries. Everything's like lumped together until you become American. Then you learn independence, right? We're from the West. Anyways, something else there. So we unite with Brahman via physical and meditational techniques. These techniques aid in bringing about an altered state of consciousness. That's when you're starting to like You're going into a level that you don't want to be. That's not what God has intended us to do. Which releases one from the inner cycle of reincarnation, which is called samsara. We talked about that in Hinduism 1. So in in, um, Hinduism, there's this thing called samsara, reincarnation. Reincarnation in Hinduism is this endless cycle of birth, right? You're born, and then you die, and based on your karma, what you did, you are reborn again. It's actually bad. You're born, based on your karma, your deeds, right? You die, but when you die, you don't go to heaven or hell. You're reborn in another form on earth. So the goal of yoga then would be moksha, which is Salvation. That means salvation. The goal of yoga is liberation from samsara, liberation from reincarnation, because reincarnation is bad. You don't want to continually be born on this earth. Reborn on this, rebirth, or reborn on this earth is not a good thing. How do you do it? Karma. You know, we, we hear these words. We even use these words, right? Karma. We know that karma instinctively by how it's used in our context. If you do something bad, it'll come back to you. You do something good, it'll come back to you. The only, the only problem is that in Hinduism, uh, uh, all karma is bad. In New Age, right, you can... Okay, let's, let me put it another way. You can do good karma in Hinduism, but... You can't really 
you can't, in, in, in Hinduism, karma makes you, like if you're a thief or you're a murderer, you will come back in the next life as a lower form. You can't really improve that. You're going to continue to regress in your life. That's why they have these caste systems, right? These caste systems are completely segregated. It's segregation. It's segregated. And once you've fallen below the first three castes, uh, you're in trouble, right? You're here in the very bottom. And that's, why, that's part of the reason why India is such a poor country, because if you're a rich person in India, you're never going to help the poor. They're poor because they deserve it. They deserve it because they must have done something in their previous lives that were bad. That's why they are now poor. They just continue to regress. There's no hope in Hinduism, in real Hinduism. Okay? It's only in New Age, because we're Westerners, we like to make things better, right? So karma in New Age, you can make it better. You, it's actually good karma, and you can get good benefits from it. So the goal of Hinduism is moksha. The goal is not to improve your life, your your stance of life here on earth, the goal is to be liberated from life, that you won't be reborn. That's the goal. That's moksha. How? We talked about this. According to Yoga Sutras, through the eight limbs of yoga. I'm going to really fly now because we're running out of time again. Here are the eight limbs. These are like disciplines, right? Restraints, observances, asana, which are postures, pranayama, breathing, and so on. Um, so a lot of my Christian friends who practice yoga, I've talked to them about this, they don't think there's anything wrong with it because they're saying, well, yoga is only asana or pranayama. They don't know that, but they say it's only posture and it's only breathing. I'm not doing anything. I'm just doing a posture. I'm only doing a breathing. Um, but you don't realize, though, that in where yoga comes from, what it means is when you start breathing, when you start posturing, you, you're, going, you're going towards, you're, you're beginning to go towards a spiritual realm. When you're going to a spiritual realm that's not of God, there's a word for that. It's called the occult. So let's look at it specifically. How, do, how does that look like in one form of yoga? Kundalini yoga, which is adapted into the Hatha yoga uh, of 11th century, is very similar to the eight limbs. It's one form of yoga, right? There's many forms. Here's one very popular form. The goddess Kundalini is a female serpent lying dormant uh, at the base of, your, of one's spine. While lying at the base of the spine, she is separated from her lover, Shiva, which is one of the three main gods of Hinduism. There's 330 million gods, but there's three main ones. Shiva is one of them. So Shiva's here on top. The Kundalini goddess is right here on your spine in the back. Okay? That's where the name, the form of yoga comes from. Yoga practice, then, when you start posturing, when you start breathing, uh, it moves, to, it arouses Kundalini, the goddess. That's, that's what the practice is supposed to be. But it's marketed here in the West in a, under different terms. When the top, the crown is reached, the union of Shiva's Shakti occurs, leading the yoga practitioner into divine enlightenment and union with Brahman. So here's the classic Kundalini school of thoughts. The human body has seven energy centers that run down in the spine called chakras. You see those dots, those colored? We have, allegedly, we have these energy centers in our body, seven of them. They're invisible to the naked eye. These chakras serve different parts of your being. When they are blocked or unbalanced, it causes one's health to suffer. You have anxiety, you have depression, anger issues, because some of your chakras are out of place. They're not balanced. Okay, those are seven chakras. I'll read them real quick. 
The root is the base. It's for survival, stability, ambition, and self-sufficiency. The sacral is a lower abdomen. It deals with sexuality, creativity, and self-worth. The solar plexus is a uh, navel and bottom of the rib cage. It deals with one's e ego, anger, and aggression. The heart, number four, is the heart region. It deals with love, attachment, compassion, passion, and trust issues. The throat, which is around the thyroid, thyroid gland, deals with contentment, uh, aggression. The third eye, which is between your two eyebrows, uh, brings concentration and awareness. And a crown, the head, is spiritual enlightenment. Okay, let's go back to um, asana, which is postures, and pranayama, which is breathing. Those are the two main things, right? Because when people practice yoga, us Westerners, all they ever, all they, they just market it as some type of exercise. That's all they say, right? So is, is it okay to exercise? Okay, so asana is a posture. Positions of the body used to activate open your prana flow. Your chakras are blocked. There are these energy centers. You suffer with anger or depression because one of your chakras is all messed up. It's blocked. It's not flowing correctly. So when you do a posture, a yoga, I'm not sure if it's a yoga posture, but let's say it is, or this, or I don't know what that is, but you start doing these yoga postures, it starts releasing. It begins, the whole idea is it begins to release, unblock these chakras. Right? That's the whole idea. Okay, so you can make a case for it that you're just loosening up your body, right? You loosen up your body and the blood is flowing. You can make that case. Or if you're looking at the traditional, the, the, the intent behind this religion is that there's, it's spiritual. It's something internal, right? Okay. This represents the first stage in isolation of the consciousness and are vital for transcending the human condition. Pranayama, or breathing, the breathing releases the chakras and uncoils kundalini, that goddess, up the spine until one reaches samadhi or enlightenment in the crown. Pretty interesting. When that happens, right? When, when, when the breathe, right? So, okay, so, so let's say I do a posture. Let's say this is a posture, right? I'm kind of releasing some chakras. I start loosening it up and then I learn to breathe. And then as I'm breathing, that, that snake, the kundalini snake begins to, to be loosened up and it starts moving up the sh seven chakras, bringing each energy center into balance and bringing my mental health and spiritual health back into place, into alignment. That's the whole idea. The, the better postures I do, the more postures and the better breathing techniques I have as I move up and a better meditation concentration I have, the healthier I'm getting. I'm not an expert in this stuff. It's what I've done in my reading. The control and directing of breath uh, is alleged to have divine energy within the human body. Divine. We're not talking about physical energy or mental energy. We're talking about divine Perfect control of prana makes one God. That is what original yoga intentions are. But it's never marketed in the West in that way. So we don't know that. We don't realize that. Then the whole of nature will begin to change and a door of knowledge will open. No more will you need to go to books for knowledge your own mind will have become your book containing infinite knowledge. I don't need to go to the Bible anymore. I don't need to, you know, read any researches anymore because I have divine knowledge within. We see this in every country, sects that have attempted to control prana. In the U.S., there are mind healers, spiritists, Christian scientists, and hypnotists, etc. Let's analyze the eight limbs. The eight steps are interdependent of each other. Thus, 
Steps three or four, the breathing and exercises cannot be separated from the others. Remember we talked about pantheism? There's nothing in pantheism or monism that uh, you cannot, nothing can exist separately. All is one, all is one monism leads to all is God. Pantheism, all is God or God is all. You, really, you have the eight steps, but the steps three and four really can't be separated from the spiritual. It depends on the other steps. Or you can say it leads to the other steps. Dr. John Ankerberg and Dr. John Weldon are these Catholic um, apologists. They're pretty good. They write, all systems of yoga are designed to bring about those psychosomatic changes in the body which are essential for the metamorphosis of consciousness. The Iyengar Institute of San Francisco, a two-year two year certified, it's certified because of science, right? It's a school, but the philosophies come from the Yoga Sutras, two units. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita, which is one of the holy books of Hinduism, two units, and the Physiology of Yoga, the force of prana, one unit. That is complete Hinduism. But they're saying it's just a form of yoga. Continue. Swami Vishnu Devandanda says, this is a Swami, this is a, a spiritual teacher of Hinduism. This is what he says. The aim of all yoga practice is to achieve truth wherein the individual soul identifies itself with the supreme soul of God. This is not from a Christian professor who studied Hinduism. This is from a guy that practices Hinduism. Here's Dr. the two Catholic guys again. Prana, God, and occult energy are all one of the same. The one who practices yogic breathing is by definition attempting to manipulate occult or spiritual energy. Okay. How is that different from Christian meditation? Let's get back to our worldview, who we are in Christ. The definition of Christian meditation is taking time to contemplate in silence a passage of scripture which, with the intent of hearing the voice of God. The ability to hear God's voice and obey his word. We are grown into what Thomas A. Kempis calls a familiar friendship with Jesus. He's a 14th century German monk who wrote this really famous devotional, uh, devotional book called The Imitation of Christ. If you ever want a good devotional book, a classic, Imi Imitation of Christ uh, from Thomas A. Kempis is really good. He talks about the purpose of Christian meditation is a familiar friendship with Jesus. That's so important. I don't even, I don't even think some churches realize this. All these churches are legalistic that I have helped out in. They don't understand that at the, end, the end result of your relationship with Christ is to be his friend, right? They don't understand this. Christians do not understand this. What happens in meditation is that we create an emotional, this emotional and spiritual space which allows Christ to construct an inner sanctuary in the heart. You create this space, right, where Christ dwells in you. And you're communicating with Christ. Okay. Easter meditation. Easter med meditation focuses on emptying the mind. Right? Remember when the Marahishi Mahesh Yogai taught his practitioners? You force the emptying after doing a mantra for a few days, you force the emptying of your mind. So Maharishi Mahesh Yoga says, the clutter in our minds comes in the way of true knowledge of the infinite, thus the TM technique. The freedom from thoughts approach has two problems though. It has a philosophical problem, even a practical problem according to Matthew chapter 12. We'll look into that fairly soon. 
So let's do a compare and contrast between Christian meditation and Easter meditation. Easter meditation is an attempt to empty the mind. Christian meditation is an attempt to get away from the world. In that, in that sense, you're kind of emptying your mind, but you fill the mind. It's, it's very different. Easter meditation stresses the need to detach from the world. Here it is. Christian meditation stresses the need to detach from the world, but attach to God. Two different things. The objective of Easter meditation, or the object, is yourself. Right? I want to reach my unlimited human potential. I, me. The object of Christian meditation is God. The method, Easter meditation, there are many metrics, but the most famous one is mantra. Mantra. Method of Christian meditation, of course, scriptures, right? Everything comes from scripture. Whether we pray or fast, practice spiritual disciplines, comes from scripture. Purpose, an altered state of consciousness. Uh, purpose of Easter meditation is an altered state of consciousness. The purpose of Christian meditation is repentance and obedience. Two big, two very different things. The goal of Easter meditation is unite yourself with God. The goal of Christian meditation is friendship with Jesus, knowing God's will and obeying. The consequence of Easter meditation, consequences. I'm just going to read, read some quotes. You probably won't have time to copy all this down. Kundalini energy is admittedly an occult energy. It is personal and supernatural. It can function independently of, person, of the person. It permeates and infuses the individual. It can force spontaneous and, yogi, and yogic and other actions, including worship. It produces a form of consciousness and personality alteration hostile to Christian faith. It is described as being possessed uh, by those who experienced it. Again, this is Dr. John Ankerberg and Dr. John Weldon, two uh, Catholic apologists who are, who, that's what they make their whole life's ambition, to know, to know different religions, know how to compare and contrast to Christianity. Okay. Perhaps the dominant characteristic in Kundalini, Kundalini arousal and other yoga practice is an experience in energy infusion, or you can call possession. It's from Tao Brook, Raiders of Cosmic, Cosmic Circle, Gods of the New Age. A leading guru, Swami Muktananda, reveals that he was violently shaken by his spirit as part of the divine work of Kundalini within him. A great deity in the form of my guru has spread all through me as chiti energy and was shaking me. And when I sat for meditation, my whole body shook violently, just as if I were possessed by a god or a bad spirit. I'm going to run. Oh, shoot. I don't have much time. You know what? I'm going to do this real quick in three minutes. So we can review this a little bit next week. Here's a biblical response. Concerning Christian meditation, don't just empty your mind. Fill it with scriptures. Psalm 1 and 1 2. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in a way of sinners who take or sit in a company of mockers, but those whose delight is in the law in the law of the Lord, and in this law he meditates day and night. It's beautiful scripture. Second Corinthians ten. For though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to the make it, you know, make it obedient to Christ. So it's all about your mind, right? You take the mind. You got these evil thoughts that come to your mind. You don't just empty it. 
you take it captive to Scripture, right? This is what Scripture says about how you respond to someone who's hurting you. You forgive them, right? And you, whatever Scripture tells you, that's your mind. And you take it captive to the obedience of Christ. That's how you fight the spiritual war. It, how you behave comes from what you believe. It comes from your mind. That comes from meditation. Concerning postures, Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing God. This is your true and proper worship. I'm, you know, I, my body, right, as a Christian, is made for God. Whatever I do is to serve God and the mission he has given me. I'm supposed to keep my body healthy in order to serve God. Keeping it healthy doesn't mean that I make my body a, a God, that I'm totally completely into all perfect diets just to make myself healthy all the time because sometimes God might call me to a place where I have to sacrifice my body, but my body belongs to God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? There it is, who is in you, uh, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were brought you know, with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. I'm not doing postures to release some chakras in order to become God. That's selfish. That's occultic. I'm using my body for God, not for the occults. Okay, I'm going to continue. Concerning the deception and consequences of wanting to be God. Genesis 3, 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, uh, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, right? Isn't that what... When Eve took the fruit, her eyes were open, right? What did a serpent say? Take this. Who was it? It was the serpent. You can say it's Kundalini. I, mean, I don't know, but it's a serpent, right? That came to her, tempted her, and the whole goal for, for, that he gave her is to be like God. Isn't that what pantheism is? The goal of pantheism, yoga, is to be God. I'm not going to read this. Isaiah 14, Tobit 14. Well, I'll read it here. This is uh, Satan, the I am's, right? How ye have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. Ye have been cast down to earth, you who once laid low in the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit, I will sit in throne on the most of, of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high but you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Everything is about I. I'm going to ascend. I'm going to be like God. It's pride. That's pride. Concerning the consequences of wanting to worship idols, Romans 1, um, 21 to 25. Just, uh, if you just put that down, you can read that another time. Concerning the practice of yoga, 1 Corinthians 10, 23 to 24. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Uh, let me just read that real, one real quick. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. These Corinthians were coming. They were pagans. And then uh, the husband would become a Christian or the wife would become a Christian. They would go to the marketplaces and they would buy meat that's sacrificed to idols, to pagan idols. And so they would ask Paul, should we eat this, this meat? Should we eat this meat? They were sacrificed to pagan idols, pagan gods. And Paul's basically saying, look, you know that that has no power. It has no power, so you can eat it. If you have good conscience about it, right, it has no power. You can eat it. I mean, it's cheaper, right? Meat that's been sacrificed to idols is much cheaper than buying regular meat. That's why you save a lot of money. That was a practical thing. But there's a spiritual thing. Should we buy it, Paul? And he says, you can do it. But if it causes people to stumble or you have a bad conscience, don't do it. That's basically what he's saying. So that is the best case scenario I can give yoga, right? I, I would probably say don't practice it. No, I'd say don't practice it. I would tell people do not practice it. I would never promote it myself. I have Christian friends that practice it. And I say, all right, look at your conscience. Are you causing people to stumble? Why are you practicing it? And someone asked me here, well, how about Tai Chi and acupuncture? Um, I th Man. I don't have time. Um, I think that they're all similar, right? 
it's very similar to yin and a yang. We try to keep this in balance. I think yoga is more strong with its emphasis on becoming God, but I think they're similar. And I worked with two pastors, no, three pastors in San Francisco, two different churches. They taught their people Tai Chi. They taught, and I, was, I had this discussion with them. Are you sure it's okay? Go ahead. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so that's the argument, right? They're saying that, well, back then, they lived in very dangerous war zones. They need to practice martial arts. Tai Chi is a martial art. That's what, that's what the argument for, right? So that's why I'm saying it's maybe a little bit lesser than. So what happens, the, art, the, the, the whole thing is, oh, it's just a, we learn martial arts. We learn Tai Chi to balance the yin and the yang um, so that we defend ourselves. And it also some health benefits to it. And then they're saying, oh, somewhere along, the relig religion came attached Taoism to it, right? That's the argument. It attach, so therefore we should be able to practice it. So there are a lot of Chinese Christians that I know that that has for their business acupuncture. Am I going to tell them give up your business? That's what they study. That's what. Okay, well maybe you practice acupuncture to bring balance and health to the people, and um, they're not really thinking about the religion part. So um, maybe they attached. Taoism to it, so maybe it's not. It's 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 a it's a really controversial stuff. I have some videos on it, but right now I'm just saying that yoga for me is a little bit stronger in terms of its union with God. Tai Chi, it's, I think there's some there's some foundations of it. Taoism. I read I read an article by John Piper, right, this famous pastor. He doesn't recommend it, but even he admitted that he doesn't really know a lot. So that, I sit with him. There's some stuff there that's you know Eastern mystical stuff. But at the same time, I just say, be careful everything that you do. Okay, that's it. Well, next week, we're going to go into Buddhism next week.